I try to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I try to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, neurotropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host and I am very, very excited to welcome you to the 100th episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing improvement of your own brain and anybody else's brain who you care to improve by any and all means at your disposal. As completely arbitrary as it is, the number 100 is kind of a big deal. I mean, I guess it's not entirely arbitrary, but anyway, this is kind of a special episode and we'll be doing a couple of special things, but our guest this week is actually very special too. We're going to have on an honest-to-goodness card-carrying genius, a guy for whom maybe episode 100 was exactly the wrong choice because his IQ is about as far from 100 as anybody we've ever had on the show. His name is Rick Rosner and he has blown away pretty much every IQ test that's ever been thrown at him, maxing these things out one after another another after another, and is something of an intellectual celebrity as a result of it, and has had a really, really interesting and weird career path. We're going to be talking with him about pretty much everything, kind of life from the perspective of a genius, his thoughts on society, on futurism, on technological trends and ultra longevity, health, brain health, and things as far afield as time travel and stand-up comedy. We go all over the place, and he's got interesting opinions across the board. That'll be in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, in honor of the fact that it is Halloween this weekend. Tomorrow is Halloween as I record this. And with a bit of a hat tip to movies like The Exorcist and The Ring that have these scary little kids, I'm going to tell you about something that might be growing inside your child that could be turning him or her evil. (laughs) That'll be in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick. But first, let's kick things off, as usual, with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So this is pretty cool. We all know that our fingerprints are essentially unique, and it has recently become clear that our retinas can also be used to uniquely identify us in a population of around 8 billion people. What neuroscientists have now found is that it is possible to identify people based on their brain regions, and in particular, a fairly coarse map, meaning not particularly detailed, of which brain regions pair up in scans of brain activity. This pattern of activity, regardless of what the person is doing cognitively, is found to be stable enough that in a sample of 126 people, researchers could look at a brain scan taken the following day and say which person it was from the 126 that they scanned the day previously. This was possible even if during one scanning session the person was at rest doing essentially nothing and the other they were busy doing some task. So the key point here is that this fingerprint-like individuality is based on brain activity, not the organ's actual physical structure. The researchers drew a map based purely on fMRI readings of which brain regions tended to activate at the same time. In each of those scans, the researchers looked at what was happening in 268 spots within the brain. How closely did the ups and downs at one spot match up with the ups and downs at all 267 other spots? This produced a profile of the flow of activity in each brain, and even at this relatively low-resolution measure, they were still able to pick the right person out of the crowd of brains 90% of the time on subsequent days. They also found that these brain profiles correlated with that gold standard of intelligence known as fluid intelligence, the sort of cross-purpose, use-it-for-whatever-you-want-to intelligence that's not tied to particular skills but is just general cognitive flexibility. Said PhD student Emily Finn, None of us would recommend a brain scan over an IQ test, but this is a strong proof of concept that these connectivity profiles are very relevant to sophisticated cognitive behavior. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast where smart people talk about smart drugs. So being that this is our 100th episode, rather than highlighting any specific iTunes reviews or listener emails or anything like that, I would instead like to give a big retrospective, historical, and ongoing thanks to absolutely everybody who has reached out in the history of this podcast, which is coming up actually on our three-year-old birthday. We're not quite there yet, but we're almost three. But I think it's fair to say that over the course of the podcast now, we've probably had direct two-way communication with over a thousand people, whether it's emails that we've received or people that have reached out on Twitter or people that have bought something from Axon Labs or people that have made a suggestion in the suggestion box. At this point, you know, the podcast has become an increasingly participatory process with the audience. If you're somebody that's got your fingerprints on it already, you know who you are. Thank you very, very much. And open invitation. If you haven't reached out yet, definitely do. We love hearing from people. And at the risk of sounding like a broken record, we get a lot of our best ideas for things to cover from you guys. So thanks to everybody out there. 
A little bit of random reorganization news. I'm doing a little bit of a early New Year's resolution to try to get more writing done, and I'm going to be trying to write one article per week for the website and also probably take over most of the newsletter writing for the podcast. And I would heartily encourage you to sign up for that newsletter if you have not done so already. You can go to smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter, and you will make me a very happy guy. I will attempt to reciprocate by making you a very happy reader of weekly news from around the world of neuroscience, updates on our latest goings-on, things we got coming down the pike, and very likely some special offers that we can make available to listeners. I've got a bunch of brain tech companies that are starting to reach out to try to get reviews done of various things. Maybe we'll be able to swing a couple deals, have some discounts or freebies or something to give away. I'm not saying for sure, but stranger things have happened. Not entirely unrelated. I should also call to mind our project Axon Labs on the web at axonlabs.io. You've heard me talking about it for the last couple of months. And if you want to celebrate the 100th episode of Smart Drug Smarts in true cognitively enhanced fashion, then the closest thing that we've got to the Smart Drug Smarts play at home game is of course our cognitive stack Nexus and its sibling mitochondrial stack named Mitogen, both of which we've got. We released these, I guess, about 15, 20 episodes ago, back during July of this year, but they're available for sale over at axonlabs.io, but both because it's the 100th episode and also the kickoff to the holiday season, for the next couple of weeks we're going to be having a sale over at Axon Labs. Both those stacks are going to be available on discounted prices. You can just buy a jar for yourself, you can buy a bunch of jars for members of the family when they come over for Thanksgiving, you could buy a subscription going into next year. You got a whole lot of options, but you can be the hip one, the forward thinking one in your family this holidays, trying to get everybody healthier, everybody smarter, instead of gorging yourself on turkey and whatever else and drinking 80 proof eggnog. So plan ahead, pay a visit over at axonlabs.io and give that a try if you haven't done so already. Smart Drug Smarts. So there was a lot of hemming and hawing behind the scenes over here at Smart Drug Smarts when we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do for episode 100. And I think it's fair to say that some of the crazier ideas will wind up making their way into future episodes, but we didn't want to do like a particular compound or a particular intervention or study and and seem to be like giving undue attention to any one thing. It kept circling back to the idea that, you know, this is a show about how to get smarter. And wouldn't it be cool to just highlight what the end game looks like there? And so we're like, okay, who's the smartest person that we could find to be on the show? And so we started looking around a little and came across the man who was our guest, who is Rick Rosner, who's a guy who's a little bit hard to know where to start when you start talking about him. Rick Rosner beats IQ tests. There's sort of a second tier of IQ tests to try to get fine-grained readings when people are too smart for a standard IQ test, which only goes up to 150, and he takes sort of this second tier of IQ tests and maxes them out. He's scored on a couple of tests at a 190 IQ. For reference, a genius is considered anybody over 140, and 160 is really, really exceptional. So I didn't know what to expect when talking with a guy like this. I didn't know if it was going to be trying to drink from a fire hose where he was going to be spitting ideas at me in binary faster than I could possibly keep up with it and find the next question to ask or even comprehend what he was saying. But he wound up talking a lot more like a ground-level human than I ever would have expected, which was quite the relief. And we wound up talking for a long time. We spoke for almost an hour and a half. You're going to hear a truncated version of this conversation because we went down some rabbit holes that that took a long time before they circled back to any place remotely relevant. But I I think we will make an extended version of this interview available as an overdose edition sometime in the next couple of weeks here. So I'll let you know about that. But consider this sort of the Rick Rosner starter kit. But a couple other facts to drop on you before we get into the interview so these don't seem like non sequiturs when they come up. The things that Rick Rosner has done in his life do not really match well with what you might think of as the archetypal life of a super genius. He's not working on cryptography for the government. He's not trying to improve on string theory. He has spent a large portion of his life writing jokes for television shows and quiz questions for quiz shows. He's very into physical health, but he credits this as much to a strong case of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, as to any sort of logical rationale. He says that he works out five times a day, and when we scheduled the call, he had just gotten back from a workout, and after the call was over, he was going to go to the gym again and get in another workout. And he has even been, I'm not kidding, a professional stripper. So clearly this is not just a genius, but an eccentric genius. But that's probably enough preamble. Let's get to the interview now with Rick Rosner. When I was a little kid, I started doing stuff early, but this is the early 60s and nobody knew what to do about it. I wasn't even kicked up a grade because I had terrible social skills. But, you know, my parents knew I was some kind of genius thing, and they weren't that thrilled about it because, as I said, nobody knew what to do back then, and they weren't looking for it as 
many parents are today. So they tried to have me grow up normally, which didn't work because I was pretty nerdy, which was bad back then. Young People who were under 30, say, don't know how bad it was to be a nerd in the 60s and 70s. So I got a hold of my permanent record from high school and all the grades before, which had all my IQ scores, and they weren't really that high. They maxed out at about 150. That's not smart enough to justify just being a pure nerd. I've got to learn how to live as a regular person. So I became a bouncer and a stripper. Not a good stripper, but it was Colorado, and the standards weren't very high. Then later, I found high-end IQ tests, tests that are designed to go higher than the regular tests that I was taking in school. It turned out that I'd maxed out at 150 because that's as high as the tests went. I started taking tests that purportedly go up to 180, 190, 200, and started getting scores in that range. And it's a silly waste of time. Some of these tests take 100 hours or 200 hours to do a good job on. I've taken a bunch of them, and it's hard to stop because even though they're ridiculous, it's something I'm good at, and that makes them attractive to me. There's some types of intelligence that IQ tests don't do a terribly good job of measuring, but how do you feel about their overall efficacy? Somebody has a saying that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other ones. Yeah, that's Churchill. Okay, well, same with IQ, where... It's a terrible way to measure intelligence, except compared to whatever other ways you might come up with. And it gets tangled up with a lot of other things. In my case, and a lot of other people's cases, it's how desperate you are to have something going for you. So persistence and obsession. I've got plenty of OCD. One test I'm working on now, I've been messing with for years now, because There's no point in me taking an IQ test and underscoring my other scores, but to get a crazy great score, you have to invest a nutty amount of time. And people like Bill Gates, he's busy making $40 billion. He's not going to have time to spend on ridiculous IQ tests. So tests are going to miss guys like him. Do you think that some of these types of social success or business success are not necessarily terribly correlated with IQ, or or at least that maybe a mere 130, 140 might be enough for uh, that sort of success? I can't code computers. It's one of the things that I never learned to do because it was nerdy and I wanted to quit being nerdy, which was a mistake because I don't have $40 billion. But uh, I think if somebody is an awesome coder, That's probably an indication of a super high IQ because from what I know about it, it's crazily complicated and it's that same kind of super involved problem solving. So if Bill Gates himself is awesome at coding, and even if he isn't, he got into Harvard, which means he got great SAT scores, which are correlated with IQ. I'd like to see all the presidential candidates forced to take the SAT. Because I think some of the candidates are dopes, and it would be nice to have that verified. That's actually a question that I'd like to bounce off you also, is the idea of intelligence versus wisdom. How do you define those two terms, and how do they relate to one another? Because I would think we might not need the world's smartest politicians, but it would be nice to have the world's wisest politicians. Well, I do a lot of stuff that's unwise, because I've always been in the habit of trying to figure out how to do stuff. And often the plans made by one guy, even a smart guy, backfire compared to, you know, just following what everybody else is doing, which has the strength of history and numbers. When IQ was a bigger deal, people used to like to accuse high IQ people of not having common sense. Now that kind of everybody has become smart and smartness is part of the culture, But yeah, there is a difference between smartness and wisdom, though it becomes increasingly hard to distinguish. There was always a little bit of bullshit to that accusation because often wisdom was just doing what everybody else did, even if it wasn't the best thing to do. Like in the South, everybody was okay with slavery. Earlier in the century, the great majority was not comfortable with interracial dating or gay marriage or whatever. So the common sense of everybody isn't always common sense. Plus, the culture right now is changing so fast that common sense has a hard time keeping up. 
We hear a lot about how NBA players, they have all these difficulties living in a world that's kind of designed for people around five foot nine when their average height is around a foot taller than that and the problems that come with that. Is there a parallel analogy for you being so far above where the average person is intellectually? I see myself being stupid every day. A lot of the time I don't feel smart. And then I think about everybody else and I'm like, whoa. I'm surprised by how consistent the product brains are. You know, you don't have people with two-foot brains and people with eight-foot brains. Everybody is in a tighter range than that. Sometimes you get magic dumb people in movies and TV shows, dumb people who know they're dumb, which gives them a kind of wisdom. But in real life, you know, dumb people have all sorts of things they tell themselves to convince themselves they're not dumb. And you have an entire political party that's based on cynically exploiting dumb people. What do you think the world would be like if the average person were, let's say, 30% smarter? Everybody is 30% smarter. There's a thing called the Flynn effect. Since World War II, the average IQ of all people on Earth has gone up by 15 or 20 points, which is huge. And Flynn, the discoverer of this effect says it's not that our grandparents were idiots, it's that pop culture has so saturated the world that it's taught everybody how to think in modern kind of IQ testy kind of terms. The generation gap of the type that existed in the 1960s, where adults and kids had two different sets of knowledge, that doesn't exist anymore. Everybody at least knows who Justin Bieber is. I don't know if that's a sign of increased intelligence, but I'll see where you're going with this. I think tech secretly makes everybody smarter while apparently making everybody stupider. Because we see people being stupid with tech all the time. People who are oblivious because of of tech. At the same time, the same thing that's making them oblivious gives them access to all the information in the world almost instantly. And that somehow has to be making us smarter. And I think the process is going to continue. I think eventually we're all going to get borged out with little brain buddies attached to us or jacked into us or implanted in us. You know, it won't be just cops who record every single moment. We'll all have body cams, and within 50 years, all but the technically Amish will be having additional biocircuitry added to themselves in one way or another. So the idea of genius is, I don't know if it'll die out, but it'll become a little obsolete because everybody will be able to make themselves a lot smarter. The question is, will those technologies be additive or will they be a multiplier on whatever sort of biological intelligence a person already has? Zuckerberg says he eventually wants Facebook to be telepathic. I didn't read the rest of the interview to see exactly what he meant, but I think he means that people won't just send pictures of cats and sunsets to each other. They will send how they felt seeing the cat or the sunset. So given that, that we are going to get kind of hivey, probably, I don't know if you can talk about additive or multiplicative, because we're going to be so much all up in each other's brain business. It's going to be weird. I think it's crazy that people aren't more freaked out by how weird everything is going to be. What else strikes you as blind spots that society has? When you look at the general trends, what do you think we're not paying attention to that we should be? It's mainly this wave of tech that is slowly and then more quickly crashing onto us where we just gobble up the new devices and the apps without stopping to think that Each thing is part of an avalanche that's going to wipe out what we consider our humanity. I think overall it'll be good. I think that we'll find out that what makes us valuable isn't necessarily our biological imperatives, but it's going to be just so frickin' different. When politicians talk about the world we're leaving our grandchildren, our grandchildren are going to be so different from us. And... I think that's people's major blind spot. I think it's Kuhn who wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which says, among other things, that sometimes you just have to wait for the old scientists to die. Well, a lot of the current controversies will die off with, along with the people who hold dumb opinions, though we'll have all sorts of future controversies that'll be even more heated than our current ones. 
What do you feel about the state of life extension technologies? Like, will we be in a situation where the people that still harbor some old ideas are actually going to die off? Or are we nearing that point where medical life extension might allow some of today's politicians to still be around in 50 years, 60 years? I think people my kid's age have a good shot at living indefinitely. I think people my age, I'm 55, are going to have to get super lucky to crack 110. But it's all coming. Everything's going to get figured out in the next 30 years, biologically. And then within 60, 70, 80 years, they'll figure out how to digitize consciousness and make it so you can take yourself out of yourself when your body wears out. So it's all coming. I think people my age are going to be the frustrated people who just missed the boat. Ray Kurzweil, the main guy who lives like a lunatic in order to live long enough to live forever, says you don't need to live into the era of immortality. You only need to live long enough so that science can extend your life by a year for every year that you live. That's kind of the escape trajectory. Well, I mean, it's, it's why I take 70 pills a day. I hope to get a lot of bonus years. Of the 70 pills that you're taking, how many of those might directly be related to brain health rather than overall physical health? Maybe half a dozen. Can you tell us which ones those are? Well, let me start with metformin, which is not for brain health, but everybody should take it because it has a bunch of positive effects. It makes your body use insulin more efficiently. It holds down blood sugar spikes. Being diabetic pretty much means that your cooker is running hot, so you end up cooked faster than somebody who doesn't have diabetes. But everybody could stand to have their cooker turned down a little bit. The vitamin and research entity out of Florida says everybody above a certain age should pretty much be on it. Then the one brain drug that I know works is coffee. I'm not working right now, except on my own stuff. I I got canned last year. But when I was in an office situation, I would fall asleep every day right at three o'clock, which is terrible in an office. It doesn't give you a good reputation. Then I started drinking coffee and I could stay alert for the entire day. It doesn't make me smarter, but it makes me more focused. And then a bunch of just stuff that purports to preserve brain function. I'm not really trying to improve brain function. I was thinking about that, actually, because a lot of people, myself included, are interested in taking things to improve their brain function. But you're already kind of at the point where you can't really go much higher. So it's more about just preserving the brain that you do have rather than trying to optimize it further. How do you feel about being able to make yourself momentarily more creative or momentarily more focused? I don't know. You you hear about athletes saying that their greatest moments of performance were when they weren't there, that the, the intensity of the moment took them out of themselves, and it was only the moment itself. Now, you know, I don't know if you can do that with creativity. I like thinking about physics, and sometimes I feel like if I haven't thought about it for a while, and then you know, I start thinking about it again, and the ideas that I left to kind of ferment all come back, plus new stuff in kind of moments that feel like extra enlightened. But maybe only half those moments turn out to really have generated anything of value. So it's a possibility, but I'm not sure. But there are strategies that you can follow to make yourself more effective at being creative. One thing is don't stop at your first idea. People who aren't practiced at coming up with ideas, get an idea and they think it's the greatest idea and they go off in pursuit of that idea. But people who have to come up with ideas for a living or just are in the habit of doing that will come up with a dozen ideas over a few days and pick the best one or two of those ideas, which may or may not include that very first idea that the person with one idea went off to develop. So one strategy is don't be satisfied with your first effort. Also, don't just use your phone to give yourself your dopamine rush from friends sending you emojis. Learn how to ride the internet to suck the information out of it. What do you like best, depth of knowledge or breadth of knowledge? I've had more success with breadth of knowledge. There's a guy named Paul Coymans who says that associative breadth is one of the main pillars of intelligence, that if you're faced with a novel problem, you can come up with half a dozen 
angles on it based on knowing a little about a lot, you're in pretty good shape. And as a comedy writer, which I have been for 15, 18 years, it helps when writing jokes to be able to come up with a zillion analogies and just know a little about a lot of stuff. The smart people I like hanging with are comedy people. Comedy requires probably more smartness than at other times in the history of comedy. I mean, Johnny Carson is unquestionably thought of as the greatest late-night host in history. But if you went back and watched a bunch of his monologues from the 1970s, I bet you'd be surprised at how easy, maybe almost lame, a lot of the jokes are. Not multi-level, just pretty much straightforward. Leno got criticized for the simplicity of his straightforward easiness of his jokes. I would bet you Johnny Carson's were of that ilk because people weren't as sophisticated. People hadn't heard as many jokes. If you follow comedy people on Twitter, you can easily read hundreds of jokes a day. Where if you lived on a farm in 1910, you might not hear a hundred jokes in a year. So the smartness I like are smart comedy lunatics. What motivates you now? What gets you out of bed in the morning? What gets you excited? I really like laying a couple rows of bricks before the sun gets to that side of the house, which is a little sad. But I also have a theory of the universe. Do tell. Our awareness is a more or less self-consistent, self-contained system of shared information. But so is the universe. The universe probably embodies some form of technical awareness, which you could define as consciousness. Not consciousness that's aware of us, not consciousness that we have access to, but some kind of massive information processing that does a lot of the same things that the information processing in our brain does. It doesn't mean that trees think and that rocks have personalities, but it probably means that the entity that's the universe is a functioning map of the information within a vast awareness. I'm not sure you can have consciousness without value judgments, but certainly our consciousnesses are entirely entwined with determining on a moment-to-moment basis what's good and what's bad, what's pleasurable and what's miserable. And also our consciousness is always advertising its awesomeness to ourselves. We have to stay interested in the moment-to-moment affairs of our lives, because if we get bored with that, then we make mistakes and we get killed. Consciousness wants our lives to feel kind of like a Michael Bay movie, very exciting all the time, you know, and everything seeming very important. People wouldn't spend so much time using social media if they weren't entirely convinced that what happens to them and their friends isn't, you know, among the most important things going on. Yeah, it's, it's like psychosocially, we've kind of never had the Copernican revolution, and we still think of ourselves as being at the center of the universe. Well, we have to be, otherwise we screw up and we don't survive to make offspring. Evolution is a force behind us thinking that our moment-to-moment awareness is awesome. I don't know what you get if you strip away a lot of that and see the actual kind of threadbare nature of awareness. Let me ask you a couple of different questions. Authors that you like, filmmakers that you like, where do you go to for intellectual stimulation? David Marusek, Charles Strauss, and Neil Stevenson are three authors who seem to be better than most at taking on how complicated and weird the near future is going to be. Usually when you see the near future, it's just now with different clothes and with robots who know how to love. Futurists talk about everything waking up, which is that everything's going to have a chip in it. And that chip is going to be sharing information about what's going on with it, with everything else. Sidewalks will be chipped and they'll send information about traffic patterns. Your appliances will be chipped and they'll give you little tidbits of information about your consumption habits and they'll tell you when you need to replenish the refrigerator and everything's going to be yammering at everything else. And I like writers who can at least try to sort out how that might work. I liked her, the movie, because it only took a tiny step into the future and it 
didn't do the usual hokey stuff with the future. Like, time travel movies frustrate me because most science fiction movies are not made by people with the deepest level of experience with science fiction. You get people who get really excited by a science fiction idea who aren't necessarily well-versed in all the different science fiction ideas that there are, and they go off and they develop this idea and it's kind of lopsided to people who have been exposed to a lot of science fiction. A lot of really good writers have done a lot of really good writing about time travel, but the people who make time travel movies haven't been exposed, for the most part, to all these different ideas about time travel, so then you get these kind of lazy or, or frady cat ideas like, well, by the end, everything has to be made back to the way it was. Back to the Future is a little hokey that way, but it actually takes some risks in that Marty McFly is able to make kind of accidentally some changes that do improve his family's situation when he returns to his present. Though, I mean, that's not at all how cause and effect would work if you could time travel. Not that time travel is possible, but the best people who have thought about time travel present it as you go back in time, and once you do you split off another world that has what happens after you've gone back and messed with the past. And every time you travel someplace else in time and you mess with the past, you create a new other world. So you haven't messed up your future. You should be able to return to your present because that side of the fork in the road still exists unmessed with. A really cool time travel system has those two paths able to continue to interact with each other. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very, very much to Rick Rosner for taking the time for that conversation, which was really an eye-opener. I really didn't know what to expect speaking with somebody who by all objective measures is just that smart. But what I found to be really interesting is actually like the level of intellectual incomprehensibility. When I've had experiences in my life where I'm talking with somebody, I'm like, whoa, this person is too smart to be talking with. There's probably two false flags there. One, I think, is conflating somebody being really smart with somebody just having a deep jargon knowledge of something that you don't know anything about. And if you had time to get with the jargon and sort of get the intellectual practice talking in those terms, you might find that the ideas are things that are, are totally within your capacity to understand and participate in. And the other thing is, if you're smart, you really want to make yourself comprehensible to other humans. If you, if you can't communicate effectively, then how smart are you really? And if an idea can't be conveyed clearly, then maybe the person who's doing the conveying is just trying to mask some bad ideas behind some big words and complex sentences and things like that. And instead of being intellectually intimidated, you might want to kind of look at them sideways and wondering if there's just a bunch of bluster without much underneath. What I thought was really interesting about Rick Rosner was he's got this huge intelligence, but he spent a lot of his life in the playground of pop culture, things like quiz shows and television comedy. So it's, it's a very accessible sort of domain that he's got these ideas in. We didn't really keep on the path of talking about the 70 pills that he takes a day. I don't think all 70 of them are 70 separate pills. I think some of them are repeats, like, you know, multiple fish oil capsules or something. But one point that he made that I thought was a really interesting one was that he fully assumes that a lot of the pills he takes do absolutely nothing, but he's not sure which ones those are. And so he's taking the gamble of taking more pills, more supplements than are probably useful on the assumption that the ones that are helping are helping and the ones that aren't helping probably aren't hurting either and better to uh, err on the side of too much supplementation than too little. Take that for what you will, but I thought that was an interesting perspective. But now let's switch gears to the Halloween edition of the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts. Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So it is Halloween right now, and within what should be a cute, playful child, something dark is growing, multiplying, and it could be turning that child evil. Or at least angry, antisocial, snotty, and annoying, and likely to throw temper tantrums. Scientists have been looking into what causes things like the terrible twos and wondering how this might intersect with what we're now learning about the microbiome of gut bacteria that is becoming more and more clear to have a great deal of interplay with our emotions, personalities, various neurotransmitter levels, and on and on. And researchers from Ohio State University have studied the microbes and the gastrointestinal tracts of children between the ages of 18 and 27 months and found that particularly among boys, there's a great correspondence between the abundance and diversity of bacterial species and those kids' behavior. 
Correlation continued to exist even after the scientists factored in history of breastfeeding, diet, and the method of childbirth, each of which have been known to influence the type of microbes within a child's gut. The study looked at poop from 77 girls and boys and found that the children with the most diverse types of gut bacteria generally had more positive moods, were more curious, sociable, and impulsive. Said one of the researchers, there's definitely communication between the bacteria in the gut and the brain, but we don't know which one starts the conversation. Maybe kids who are more outgoing have fewer stress hormones impacting their gut, or maybe the bacteria are helping to mitigate the production of stress hormones when the child encounters something new, or it could be a combination of both. The researchers found that the gut bacterial composition, which tends to stabilize in kids by about age two, was not impacted by the delivery method, whether C-section or vaginal delivery, by the child's diet, or by the length of breastfeeding. The researchers say they could probably look further into diet than they did in the current study, because it is possible that the effects of diet would emerge if they used a more detailed assessment. One thing that they're unequivocal about is that parents shouldn't try to change their child's gut microbiome just yet because the scientists do not really know what a healthy combination of bacteria looks like, so they're not sure the target to aim for. Said Dr. Michael Bailey, The bacterial community in my gut is going to look different from yours, but we're both healthy. The perfect microbiome will probably vary from person to person. We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers, but you can call us Smart Drug Smarts. Okay, so that is the entire episode number 100, the first centennial of episodes from this podcast. Thank you very much for hanging around until the end. If you're a long-time listener, if you're a first-timer who just found the show, either way, really appreciate your being here. The podcast would never have continued nearly this long were it not for all the great support and feedback we've gotten. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want to throw a bone to the podcast here as we continue onward towards 200 episodes, 300 episodes, and beyond, introducing us around to your friends and brain-owning colleagues is always a huge help, whether that is social media, word of mouth, conspicuously placed tattoos on attractive body parts, or anything else that you come up with. One less creative but always appreciated means of helping us out is an iTunes review. But as it's Halloween, in the spirit of trick-or-treating, I leave these decisions up to you, whether Smart Drug Smarts deserves a trick or a treat. The show notes for this episode, as with all episodes, will be online at smartdrugsmarts.com, including the links to everything that we talked about here. As for me, I will be back at you next week, same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week, have a safe Halloween, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.